Thank you so much. I mean, like, I am uh, very excited to, to give this talk. Um, it's actually my first uh, international one. So I'm, uh, yeah, very excited. And um, let, let me say a little bit things about me. So I actually started as an Android developer. I played with, with iOS development. And then after that, I had a personal project which needed cross-platform and I was too lazy to write, write it in uh, both platforms. So I found about Flutter, that was in 2017. And uh, at the end of 2017, and ever since I just fell in love with Flutter as I'm sure you all did. And it's so good to be part of this community that um, it's young and vibrant and has a lot of potential and we, we can do a lot of stuff. Um, right now, I am working on some open source projects like the uh, Firebase SDK in pure art to bring support for, for desktop. And also, I've been doing some Macbox plugins and other stuff committing to, to the main Flutter repository and this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of um, projects. Okay, so I'm not sure. Can you see my screen? All yes. good. What the weather? Good. Everything's fine. Oh. <laughs> good. Okay, so as as you as you might know, probably about this uh, this um, scheme, how Flutter is structured, how it actually works. So you have your hardware, your device, you have the runner. In our case, uh, the the supported and stable versions are for iOS and Android, working on web, desktop, and all, all the rest. You have your Flutter engine. And one thing that is part of the Flutter engine is the Dart runtime. We are going to talk a little bit of this, about this. And then you have the Flutter framework, which is written in, in, in Dart. So one thing that is important to mention here is that when you ship your app in develop mode, well, you don't ship it. You put it on your device <laughs> for testing. Hopefully, um, the the code is it gets JIT compiled. You have the inspector, the developer tools, everything on your device. This allows for hot reload and other stuff, faster development. Uh, also, what one thing that is there is the Dart runtime, right? The virtual machine. But when you ship in release mode, everything is compiled to native code. But one thing that remains there is the Dart right runtime with the garbage collector. That's very, very needed in, in the application. So before we get into what is the garbage collector and how the, the garbage collector works in Dart, let's talk a little bit of why Dart is a very good language for Flutter and why Dart makes Flutter so amazing and so fast. So first things first, it's optimized for UIs. And as you might know, uh, we have we can use if in list, in set, in map, we can have for expressions, while expressions, right? So um, the Flutter team works closely with the Dart team to provide uh, really useful features for us to, to write UI stuff with, with Dart, stuff that were not previously implemented. Another thing why that makes Dart special is that it gives us a productive uh, development time. So here we, here we are talking about hot reload. We are talking about the fact that we can compile to both JIT and AOT. So, the, so, so Dart gives us these this tools. Another thing about Dart is the fact that it runs on multiple platforms. So that's awesome, right? We have Dart everywhere. So that means you don't need separate teams for different platforms. And also, this is a very good gain for for your team or for yourself if you're building something uh, personal. Okay, so we, are we, we touched a little bit about the garbage collector. So what is the garbage collector in Dart and what it does? So we know as we create objects in Dart, we allocate a little bit of space in our memory and that object resides there. When we no longer use that object, that means is not referenced anymore the garbage collector should try to clean that up and make room for new 
for new objects to, to get in. Now, given the fact that the, the Flutter framework creates objects at an inimaginable rate, right? So you have the build methods that creates objects within objects within objects, right? You might think that the garbage collector does a lot of work and we might be scared of it. What if my app stops to do the garbage collection? How can Flutter be fast in terms of garbage, garbage collection? So we are going to talk about three, three things regarding the garbage collector. So first, when garbage collection occurs and how garbage collector is done in terms of young space scavenger and then the mark and sweep uh, collection. So let's talk a, a little bit about the, um, the scheduling, right? So when, when this happens. So to minimize the effect that the garbage collection has on, on your app and on the UI performance, the garbage collector provides hooks for the Flutter engine and the Flutter engine has the opportunity to tell the garbage collection, the garbage collector, hey, the user is not doing anything right now. You can trigger a GC garbage collection and uh, nothing will happen. So because of this, Flutter gives the garbage collector windows of opportunity to run its collection without impacting the performance of, of the app. And this is, this is a very good thing. Okay, so let's talk about the space scavenger. Oh. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Sorry, so but I let. Okay, so let's talk about this phase. So the Dart garbage collector is a generational garbage collector. What does that mean? So actually it means that the space that the, your app uses in memory is split into generations. Well, it could be multiple generations, but it's split into generations. So you have a younger generation and an old generation. Now, this is constructed, this logic is constructed on the idea that the objects that are first, that are created uh, first, are the ones that might be erased or dereferenced the first. Now, this phase is designed to clean up ephemeral objects that have short lifespan. For example, your container in your build method or the padding that you use there. So that is discarded and a new one is created. The object that it was discarded because you don't keep a reference to it, hopefully, is, disc is discarded by this young space scavenger. Now, the thing is that this kind of collection is indeed blocking the UI, but it's so fast and combined with the fact that the Flutter engine sh schedules this, this kind of collection, it just eliminates received pauses in, in your app. So nothing, you, you don't see it. This is why we can have very nested widgets, trees that are just okay with garbage collection and we, we don't run into memory, memory problems. Now let's see how this works. So in terms of the first generation, right? the young space scavenger splits this kind of, this space into two spaces. So this, this space split in two on this place, only one of these spaces are, I'm saying too much spaces, okay. So if you look at the slide, you can see that there, are, there is a one active space and an inactive space. So what happens as the objects are occupying this space, right, and filling them in, this is the only space used. When this is filled, the young space scavenger kicks in. And what does it do? So it tries to see which objects are alive, which ob objects are still referenced, and which objects are not referenced. That means that it looks at the root objects, the stack objects, and then tries to see, hey, is this used? Yeah, it's used. Okay, so let's move it on the inactive space. Who is, this who is this object referring to? Okay, so this object is referring to the next one. Okay, so let's move that also. So what happens is that on the new inactive space, you will have all the live objects. And what is left on the previous space 
is just cleaned. So the process repeats again. So using this young scavengers, young space scavenger, it gives the flutter this ability of creating rapidly uh, objects and discarding them. The nice thing about this is that when a new object is created, the malloc function is not used, right? It's just a bump pointer allocation of, of objects. Now, we talked about the young scavenger. So this is the first step of the garbage collection. Now, the other one, and this is the, the kind of garbage collection we all know. So stop the world garbage collection. No one moves. I need to count my object reference. So the thing is, when do objects from the first generation, the young generation, move into this second generation? Well, when they achieve a certain lifespan when they achieve this uh, certain amount of lifespan, they are promoted to a new memory space. So this space when the mark and sweep generation collection is, is in place. So this is the guy that makes the rules in this section of the memory. Now, this mark and sweep has two phases. So first, the first phase is objects are marked. It starts with the root objects, objects are marked. And then the first object is then linked to the second object in reference and, and so on. On the second, second um, stage of this collection is when all the objects that are not marked are removed from memory. And then everything else is just unmarked. So this way, the memory is free and after this, this stage, the memory is compacted, so we don't have fragmentation. Okay, so we talked about how the garbage collection works. So one thing that we need to remember here is that we don't want to keep reference to objects, to widgets in our apps. We, we want to let the garbage collection do its job. We want to recreate them as, as let the system create objects as much as, as it, it wants to. But we can rest assured that our app, in normal cases, will not just plug and mark all the objects and do the stuff because of the way this is constructed to integrate with Flutter. So garbage collection will, will happen when Flutter says, hey, no user interaction, this is okay, I don't have any animations, and you can run your, your collection. So this is one thing why Dart is very, very good at language for uh, for working with Flutter. Now, the second topic I want to talk about is the rendering pipeline and how this makes Flutter so performant and how it makes um, so beautiful and fast animations. So in this part of the talk, we will talk about layouting and we will try to life code uh, a padding widget. So let's, let's, let's see what this is all about. So, what is the rendering pipeline? So the re this is a full rendering pipeline. Everything starts with the user input, right? The user touches the screen, then animations kick in. That means the animation tick. Now the build phase is describing the layout that you have, the, the UI. So this is your build method. You have a button, you have a container, you have some padding there. And so this is this phase and then the next two steps are actually called the rendering phrase, phase. And it com it's composed about, uh, uh, from layout, painting, and composition. Now layout, the, the, the thing that layout handles is position and sizing of the elements on the screen. Painting handles how they actually look, what color, how they are painted, right? The composition takes all of these elements, the composite, the com the Composite state, it takes all of these elements that we already have, stacks them together, and ships, us, ships it as one thing to the screen. And obviously, the last step, it's transforming this abstract thing that we have above into actual pixels on the screen. Now, we are going to talk a little bit more about layouting and how layouting is done in Flutter. Now, the theory the Flutter was built on is that simple is fast simple and well understood algorithms means fast 
uh, results. And that's, that's very true in case of layouting. Now, in other systems, I, I know for a fact from Android that I, I work with it, is how layouting and painting is done is very different than how Flutter does it. So one thing is that the layout and painting in, in Android is done together. And then the layouting is done into multiple passes. So that means that each widget, well, in case of Android will be a view, each view is visited during the layouting phase two times. First, it walks the tree and all the trees to get children to gather some data. And then the second walk would be to lay them out. This is why in, in Flutter there was this, in, sorry, in Android, there was this thing you cannot have two, two nested to nested views. You wanted your view tree to be as small as, as flat as possible. Not because there was these two passes and it was not that performant. Now how Flutter does this, in Flutter the rail is separated from the painting phase. So, and the walk is just one, one pass. The Flutter walks the tree in depth first, passing down constraints. And then up from the bottom of the tree comes up sizes. So we say something like this, hey, these are your constraints of how big you are supposed to be. And then the child says, oh, okay, thank you for this constraints. I'm gonna talk to my children. I'm gonna see what their size are. And then I'm gonna come back and say, hey, this is how big I, how, how big I, I am supposed to be. Now, this layouting allows us to, to be more scalable. So this means that we can have much more deeper trees of widgets. Also, one good thing that we need to note here is that ON layouting is valid only on the first pass of the tree. So that means when I'm first building my widget tree, it's ON, right? On the length of the depthness, sorry, of the tree. After this, only the widgets that change actually get uh, relayouted. So that's an uh, that's also an improved an improvement. So what we talked about constraints. So what are constraints, right? So we said that constraints are passed down the tree and sizes come up. So what is a constraint? So a constraint is in, for example, in the box protocol that uses the Cartesian system, it's just a width and height, right? X and Y. So the width dimension has a mean and a max, and then same for height, right? They have uh, a mean and height, uh, a mean and max. Now the rule is that the if the parent gives you these constraints, is that means that you need to be in the light blue area. So you're not allowed to be too small. You're not allowed to be too big. And with this layouting, this allows to be very, very expressive. So let's take, a, a, let's take another example. So when we talk about fixed size, right? We call this box constraints to be tight because the min and max value is the same. So this way the parent can dictate to the children, hey, you need to be this big. Now, if, you, if we talk, for example, about text, right? How text is layouted, right? In this case, we have mean and max width, which are the same value. So the width is tight, but the height of the, of the constraint is loose. That means that the values are not equal. So in case, in case of text, the text can, it knows how, how the width is, then it can add some line breaks. And after this can count the number of lines and the height can, can come up. From, from this calculation, so how, how big the text is. Same on the other, on the opposite side, right? What we, can, we, what we can see here is that this layouting system is very, very simple. So you don't have very complex algorithms to solve this. For example, in iOS, there is a, a layout, layout constraint solver that does a bunch of stuff to figure out how, where things should be on the screen. And, how it sh they should uh, they should be positioned, but and but in Flutter this is very very simple. So this keeps the code clean and makes it more 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 scalable.
So now that we talked about layouting, so let's go and try and build our own padding widget. Okay. Somewhere here. Okay. Um. Okay, okay, good. Sorry about this. Okay. And set up. Awesome. Okay. So we have a normal app here. Let me go into presentation mode. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is what I wanted. Okay, so what we want to do first here is to actually create a create a, a widget, right? So we want to have some padding to, to add some padding to this text. So let's add a padding widget here. My padding widget, and let's create this. Create class, my padding, and this should extend single child render object widget. Now, what this asks us of, asks of us is to, to create a render object. And also we want to take in a child, right? So let me just pass those in. Um, we have our widget, child, and then let's just pass this to our super key. Child and child. So to express padding in Flutter, we use edge insets. So let's define that also. So edge insets, padding, and add this here. So this, padding. Now, what we want to do here is to actually create this render object. So let's try to create it, right? So we will say something like the render object is a part of the of the Flutter framework that actually does layouting, painting, and caches the values for 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 the for future uses. Okay, so let's create our class, uh, my padding render object, my render, sorry, my render, um, my render padding. It should extend render shifted box. Now, in this case, let me, okay, good. And then also I should receive the edge insets. Good, let me define this. Here, good. And then padding and padding. Good. So now what we want to do here is to perform the layouting. So we will do, we will override the method perform layout. And what we actually want to do here is just to the, as we saw in, in the slides, the, the purpose of layouting is we get the constraints from the parent. And what we want to get back is we want to get back the our size, right? The size that we want to be. So in our case, we can obtain the constraints. So we have constraints, box, constraints, equals, oh, constraints equal with this constraint. Now, this field, what gives us is the box constraints more recently received from the parent, exactly what we, we, we talked about. Okay, so with this constraints, let's talk about what we want to do. So what we want to do is to actually get the size that we have from the, the, the children. So we have the ch child size. And then what we want to do here is to uh, shrink that size with the amount that we have from the, from the padding. So how do we do that, right? So it's quite simple in, the, in this system. So first we want to, to get the, well, we want to get the inner size of our constraints. 
and then getting out the, the padding and then pass that value to our children. So let's, let's see how that works. So we want to say something like box constraints, inner const constraints, equal with, and we have a very good method here. So constraints deflate and we give it our padding, right? Constraints, okay. Good. Now that we have this inner constraints, what we want to do is to lay out all our children. So we do children dot layout and give it layout and we'll give it our constraints. So inner constraints, and then we set it that the a parent uses data to true. That means that if the child rebuilds, that means that I also need to rebuild. So this is why we, we want to set, we set this to true. Now we, we did the layout thing for this child. What we want to do next is to position it. So how we do position it, we use the parent data, right? So do find box parent data, child parent data. Now this is actually, we have it from, from our children or from our child. And then we set the new value, right? So it will be the offset, which is offset. It's the padding, padding left. And then we'll have padding top. Now with this, with this part here, what we're actually doing is we are positioning our children from zero from the coordinates zero zero to whatever the padding tells us. Now the last part of the layouting is giving back the size to our parent. So how we do how do we do that? So we just say size, we use our constraints, and then we say that we want to constrain it by size. So the values that we provide here is actually very simple. So we say padding padding left plus child size because because now we know the size of the child why because we did the layouting All right so we do size width plus padding right so this is this is my width this is how big i am so it's the the size of the children the child that i have and then the padding left and right so we did the same thing for, for the height, right? We have padding top plus child, oop, child size height plus padding bottom. Good. So now, now what we want to do here is to pass it to our create, create render object. Sure, we skipped a little bit of steps here, but and pass in padding. And let's see how this works. Okay, so right now I didn't give it any padding. Good, good point here. <laughs> So yeah, let's give it edge sets all 64 so, so we can see it. Now, the thing that is, okay. So the thing that we are missing here is the updating of the, of the render element. So we are not recreating the render object, we just want to update it. So let's do that also. Update render object, All right? So what we want to do is just update this, this field here. So how do we do that? We say that render object, which in our case is a render object of type my render padding. And then I will say that render object padding 
I will have a getter here is equal with padding. Let's create that getter, a setter, sorry. Okay, so we say that padding is equal with padding. And then in this case, we, well, we should actually check if it's not null and everything, but for the sake of, of this, we just uh, stick with this. So, and then we, we want to mark it as needing layout. So now when we try to use hot reload, it will, it will just, um, just work. So let's go with 24 and then hot reload is, okay. So, so now it works. So how the layouting works. So first you receive constraints from your parent. You call layout on your child. You position it, your child using the offset from the child, from the, from the parent data. And then you return back to the caller, your size. So what I want to point out in, in this, okay, share. Is, is that there are a lot of awesome resources uh, out of how Flutter goes in depth. I will uh, give them on, on Twitter, unless I choose to, uh, to post them on Twitter. On Twitter. So this, um, this kind of logic is very, uh, this kind of articles are very useful because they are advanced and we know how Flutter works under the, need, under the hood. And also because we can make right decision on how to use tools and how to, um, to implement them. Also, I very, very, very much recommend the last link. So inside Flutter from the flutter.dev, that uh, document is absolutely awesome. It will take, uh, it, it take me about two to three days to actually understand everything that was in there, but it's, it's worth it. And, and you feel that you can control Flutter at a much deeper level than, than you did before. And it's yeah, very, very much, very much worth it. Thank you so much.